Hello, Ian. Hello, trabajo. Hello. Thank you very much for being so puntual. So let's carry on with the next panel. Who with press? No, me están trabajo. Yes, now which is going to address uh, the complexities, challenges, and potential of precision medicine in modern psychiatry and uh, neurodevelopmental disorders with the help of Tamara Maes, co-founder and vice president of the board of directors of Horizon Genomics, Spain. Joining her in uh, the discussion, which is uh, possible thanks to Horizon, we also welcome Josep Antonio Ramos Quiroga, head of the Department of Psychiatry, Cibersam, at Hospital Universate, Universitari Valdebron, Barcelona. Julian Nevat, head of genomics at the Institute of Medical and Molecular Genetics at Hospital Universitario La Paz, Madrid. Jacqueline Harris, assistant professor of neurology, genetics and pediatrics from the Kennedy Career Institute, John Hopkins Medical Institution, USA. And finally, Angel Alonso, Chief Scientific Officer, Navarra Strategy on Personalized Medicine. So the discussion is going to start. And Tamara, the floor is yours. Thank you very Thank much. You. OK, so uh, my name is, uh, is Tamara Mais. I'm co-founder and vice president of Horizon Genomics, previously CSO and currently president of uh, Horizon Scientific Advisory Board and your host for today's panel discussion. So I would like to welcome all the attendants in the room and all the attendants online that are joining us. So this is my legal notice. So Horizon, uh, we like to think of ourselves as an epigenetic champion uh, determined to bring new therapies to patients. We are uh, having expertise to apply to oncology and to CNS disease. We have two molecules with positive data in uh, clinical data in humans that are in phase two of uh, exploration. And uh, we have a leading and growing epigenetic platform with an expanding uh, pipeline. So the two, two of the drugs that we have in, uh, in the clinic are LSD-1 inhibitors. One is Yadadamstat envisaged for application in oncology. And the other one we will talk about more today is Vafidamstat which has been developed specifically for CNS applications. <clears throat> so our preclinical studies thought that uh, using Vafidamstat, uh, we could correct cognition deficit and behavior alterations, including aggression and social interaction in, in preclinical species in mice and, uh, and also in, uh, in rats. We published this research in, in PLOS One. You can read it. It's, it's a very extensive report of our preclinical data. So what is LSD-1? LSD-1 is a histone lysine demethylase. Uh, it removes uh, methyl groups from H3K4, histone uh, lysine 4. And uh, it is not alone doing this kind of function. There are other histone lysine demethylases like, like KDM5. And on the opposite side of the, of the mirror are the histone lysine methyl transferases like ZD1A and KMT2D. Uh, so methylated H3K4 has been associated with active chromatin and demethylated with repressed chromatin. And uh, the balance between these states will control uh, gene expression. So this has made LSD-1 also an, an, uh, an excellent target for personalized therapy in CNS. Because when uh, histone methyltransferases uh, do not pr uh, properly function, then actually uh, reducing the activity of the opposite action uh, can re-equilibrate equilibrate the, the situation. And this is an, uh, uh, an observation which is making that LSD-1 is a key target and that for the first time we can do a personalized uh, medicine approach in CNS disease. So 
I would like to move into the panel discussion now. Uh, time for hope, precision medicine in modern psychiatry and neurodevelopmental disorders. We have invited a number of uh, excellent scientists and clinicians for this panel, uh, including uh, Dr. Ramos Quiroga, uh, Dr. Nevado, uh, Dr. Harris, and uh, Dr. Sanchez. I will pass the word now to Dr. Uh, Tony Ramos Quiroga, who is online, uh, to present himself and a little bit of what he is doing at this institution. Tamara, for uh, the nice, uh, the kind presentation, and also for the invitation to be here uh, talking about our experience with uh, uh, the targeting the LSD1, plus the stat in, in, in the kind of, uh, of uh, 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 a set of psychiatric disorders. As you said, uh, my name is uh, uh, Josep Antoni, Tony Ramos Quiroga. I am uh, head of the Department of Psychiatry in Baderon uh, Hospital and, and also professor of psychiatry of Autonomous University in Barcelona. And uh, I am the president of the Innovation Commission of the, of the, uh, the Baderon Hospital and also working uh, with our arm of research in, in Baderon. Uh, in the Baderon Institute of Research as a principal investigator of our group of uh, psychiatry, mental health and, and addiction and members of the Cybersan Consortium. I don't know if it could be possible to, to have the, the, that is my, my little video, the, the next slide. Yes, uh, as I said, I am working uh, in, in the Baidebron Barcelona Hospital Campus. As you can see here on the slides, we are five uh, large institutions working in this campus. One is the Baidebron Hospital, the Institute of Research, and the other uh, institutions are the Institute of Oncology, the Center of Multiple Sclerosis of Catalonia, CINCAT, and obviously the university, the Autonomous University of Barcelona. All of these institutions, we are working, doing uh, teaching, research, clinical health care. And on the next slide, you can have uh, some pictures of our, our, our sense. Please, would you return the slide? Yes. Uh, as as, uh, as uh, you can see here, we are uh, the largest uh, campus in, in the healthcare campus in, in Catalonia. Uh, the hospital has more than one point beds, 1,000 point beds. And interestingly, in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of the portfolio of the hospital, we are doing now in, in a transversal moment nowadays more than 1,200 clinical trials. And we have a, a, the huge opportunity uh, to have these clinical trials because we have a large samples of patients, more than 1.2 million of patients every year in the hospital, uh, from the uh, children to the uh, adult, from the ch childhood to the, to the adulthood. Yes, and the next slide, uh, Tamara. At the, 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 the campus, we have these four hospitals inside the Vitebron Hospital. There's the General Hospital, the Children's Hospital, the Women's Hospital, and the Traumatology Rehabilitation and Barnes Hospital. And the mental health department are absolutely transversal on all of this. And we are working mainly with neurodevelopment disorders, disorders that start during childhood and some of these disorders, one of the characteristics is having high aggressivity or aggression periods over, over the evolution of, of, the, of the disorder. And that is one of the targets that we need to, uh, to deal. And nowadays, the, the current uh, approaches or the current treatment that we have are with a lot of inconvenience and a lot of side effects. And for that is a need that we have without good or correct uh, care. That is the, the, the first part of my presentation, Tamara. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I would like to continue now presenting Dr. Julian Nevado. Next slide. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Tamara and uh, the organizing just to invite us uh, to share with, with you the room and the online uh, our experience. 
Um, I'm a head of genomics in, uh, in HEM, that is uh, the genetic service of Hospital Universitario La Paz in Madrid. And as uh, Valdebrom, we are almost a clone. Uh, Hospital La Paz has also four hospitals in, in, in one, so in the structure. In, um, in the next slide, this is my, our, our institution in, in, in HEM. Is Instituto de Genética Médica y Molecular. Um, um, I'm a head of genomics and uh, a leading uh, such a logistic, like a, working as a core facility for the rest of our uh, partners in, inside of the INGEM and uh, all around the hospital. You see in an overview our working, you know, working in a clinical genetics routine and uh, you can see in the slide all our evolutions. It's uh, very similar if it's you advance in the slide to the, you know, the improving of uh, the resolution of the genomic techniques. Um, in the um, genomic uh, area, um, we are structuring uh, several um, um, parts but uh, mainly involved in processes in the genetics. So in uh, genomics of, uh, as a core facility, we are involved uh, in the development, in the implementation into the clinical genetic routine of many, many of the uh, recent genomic technology, such as uh, MLPA, long time ago, arrays, next generation sequencing. So this, uh, I think it's, it's enough for, at this point. Yes. So uh, I would like to continue presenting Dr. Jacqueline Harris, who will join us also remotely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Harris, and I am a, a neurologist and neurodevelopmental specialist, clinician, and researcher at uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins Medical Institute in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and we can advance the slides, please. Um, and so I specialize in patients with epigenetic disorders, um, uh, which who have neurologic and or cognitive manifestations of these epigenetic disorders, which as we will discuss is almost all patients with these epigenetic disorders. And these kind of disorders include Kabuki syndrome, rubenstein TB, Wiedemann-Steiner, Angelman, Kleistra, Soto syndrome, Melan, and CAT6A disorder. Um, and um, my uh, primary area of research is um, these epigenetic causes of neurodevelopmental disorders, um, particularly those that cause intellectual disability and how these specific genetic and epigenetic changes lead to the uh, specific neuroanatomical, neurophysiologic, and cognitive phenotypes. Um, so uh, I am interested in developing uh, specific cognitive profiles in these syndromes as uh, used for potential outcome measures in clinical trials, as well as localizing the deficits and running these clinical trials. Um, and most of my research is currently centered around one of these disorders called Kabuki syndrome. And I'm really, really pleased to be here today and thank you for having me. Thank you. And then uh, finally, Dr. Alonso Sanchez. Welcome as well. well. Thank you, Tamara. Hello, good morning, everyone. So my name is Angel Alonso. I am the Chief Scientific Officer of the Navarro Strategy and Personalized Medicine. I work for the hospital too as a clinical geneticist and for the research center. And I am also an associate lecturer in personalized medicine for the uh, public university in Navarra. So, but I would like to say that I am a, uh, a builder of the personalized medicine dream. So I, I, serve, I have served uh, different consultancies for the Spanish uh, Senate Initiative on Personalized Medicine, the European, mainly European International Consortium for Personalized Medicine, and also for the 
uh, Spanish infrastructure for personalized medicine, which has been called Impact Program, and collaborating with the one, uh, plus one million genomes in initiative in, in European Union. So what we do, so we, we, we are trying to bring all the experience we have gained in different projects to, uh, to pull together good information and good quality information for research. So we organize this, what we call the NAGIN program, which has been, is composed at the moment up to date for uh, five projects, uh, all related to bringing whole genome sequencing to the bedside of the patients for clinical uses. We have uh, used on rare diseases, on pharmacodynamics, uh, also on hypercholesterolemia, and pediatric intensive care units for rapid diagnosis. And finally, at the, at the last project we have, we are trying to organize a personalized uh, breast screening cancer program. So with this experience, experience we have gained, we, we have contributed to the Navarro strategy in personalized medicine, which at the end of the day tries to bring the best of the research to the clinical practice. And by doing this, we will be building a better healthcare. But at the same time, uh, we, we, we shall be uh, bringing new data and, and recovering new data for the patients for doing best research and pulling uh, clinical and genomic data together. We will be able to learn a little bit more about uh, mechanism and, and put this information for the research community to, to be able to, to produce targeted therapy. So I am, I am very much looking forward to, to the discussion in this table today. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, indeed. This brings us, with this introduction of the panelists, this brings us to the actual discussion, and, and I'll jump right in. So precision medicine, uh, Dr. Alonso, is an approach that aims to select the right drugs for the right patients based on the information uh, of their genome or their phenome, let's say. And could you explain how uh, precision medicine has altered uh, the, the practice in, in, in clinical oncology and, and uh, whether you think that the full potential for precision medicine has uh, already been exploited or it's, is this a work in progress? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think that, that we have to, to to have in mind the two phases of the personalized medicine. The first one would be the clinical application. And in oncology, of course, we need to, to very precisely define the, the and it's a standard, uh, standard pro protocols and panels, probably we will, a panel approach would be better in the clinical practice. But at the same time, we, we need to have the, the scientific and the research phase. And we probably need to, to arrange uh, uh, different technologies using uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, RNA, and different approaches, be because we need to have additional data, and we need to learn new mechanisms and, and learn epigenomics and how all this work to produce the disease. So, and this is essential for oncology, and, this, and precisely in oncology, has been an approach that has been working very well, and, and well, I, I think that by doing this, the, the, the full potential of precision medicine will be reached at the end. So what are a couple of examples of real success stories in, in, in oncology for uh, precision medicine? Yeah, I mean, there are cases uh, of, of drugs and cases, but I, I like the, talking about patients because I am a doctor at the end of the day, so I, I can recall a, a case of one year a child who was diagnosed with an astrocytoma and suffered uh, surgical removal, but it didn't uh, get very well. Uh, and at the end, uh, we decided to go for a whole genome sequencing of the tumor, finding that uh, an unusual 40 megabase tandem duplication uh, affecting the, the fusion of the BRAF gene. And a co uh, an agreement with the Hallowell University, uh, it, it was arranged uh, a personalized target therapy for uh, MEK inhibitors for this child. And, and, and the result was really good. So I, I find this is the way to, of doing the things. Yeah. So, so uh, to, to the whole panel and uh, 
This precision medicine, do you think it is really applicable to CNS disease? Because this is much newer. Sure. So. Uh, for sure, it could be applicable for that. But because um, we see the, you know, the precision medicine every day, where, you know, pharmacogenetics, and pharmacogenetics for the CNS is uh, is important mm -hmm. in the future. So, what are the major hurdles? for deploying a personalized medicine approach in, in CNS or neurodevelopmental uh, diseases. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramos, do you want to comment on that? Yes, I, I, I think in this aspect, uh, absolutely, we need this personalized medicine also in CNS and specifically in mental health uh, disorders, our challenge is to have um, better knowledge about uh, biomarkers or, uh, but now, with, 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 the, with the new results that we are uh, having with uh, uh, GWAS study, more than 200,000 patients included in GWAS study for a major depression, uh, thousands of patients with schizophrenia, with ADHD, autism uh, spectrum disorder also. And now we are having more and more and more and more specific genes related with these complex uh, and multifactorial disorders. Uh, I, 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 I think that after this big data, we are in better uh, situation for uh, pharmacogenetics, but also for to have a specific target with these disorders. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, all the, uh, the history of uh, psychopharmacology in terms of mental health disorders was uh, uh, driven years ago by the serendipity, but not for the, 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 the correct knowledge of the basis uh, of, of these disorders. And now we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a very sweet moment with all of this big data, more than the genetics, also the digital phenotyping data also. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe, uh, Julian, you can comment a little bit more on also on the, the strategy at your institution for, for sequencing. There are a couple of extra slides on that included. If I can. Well, I'm a geneticist as a tertiary hospital, public hospital. We're more involved, you know, in the clinical routine implementation of all these genomics uh, strategy and techniques. So with, with, with the M's at the end, if you can um, move forward, for diagnosis and research, but mainly diagnosis. In the next slide, you can see that um, we are mainly interested in all genetic basis disease because our, we're doing clinical routine genetics all every day. So, but the main, fo I main fo mainly focus in rare disease. So I'm working with all, many, many of these syndromes. If you move forward, uh, you can see I'm bringing this all, this, you know, <laughs> rice. <laughs> um, because I'm working with very closely to all these uh, patient association in the many, many of these uh, rare disease uh, syndromes. Uh, why? Well, you know, because they need it. They need it. Because many, many of these diagnoses in many of these rare diseases coming for five, almost 10 years, if you want it, lucky, and you have a diagnosis. So I'm very, very focused on diagnosis in all these uh, rare disease syndromes. So we're moving forward a little bit more. And um, the problem with uh, rare disease is uh, that most of these uh, uh, diseases are, you know, have uh, intellectual disabilities or maybe mm, involve uh, 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 autistic uh, spectrum disorders and also behavior abnormalities. So you have a lot of these rare diseases, they have so many, many uh, abnormalities of the behavior that were very, very interesting to work on. In, in the next uh, slide, and I think it's a finish. Um, we have uh, currently a great problem with uh, all these you know, clinical trials in, uh, in mental diseases. There is a, you know, many of the results of, of these clinical trials are not completely successful. Why? One of the reasons, if, uh, because uh, we have in this rare diseases, these uh, syndromes, many, many variability 
uh, clinical and genetically. And we have to be focused in subpopulation of these patients. That's one of the strategy of the precision medicine or personalized medicine. So we can move in the... In the so in Spanish, uh, precision medicine is not very well termed because uh, it, it means that the, the medicine before is in precision. <laughs> um, it is, that's not correct. But, uh, you know, this is problem of the, of the vocabulary. But uh, right, right now we are talking about genomic, genomic medicine because it's the genomic, the part of the, you know, the, this, this omics that is more developing in the last year, but maybe in the future we are, we are talking about, you know, other omics maybe involved. So um, in, the, in the last part of the self light, you know that this precision medicine or personalized medicine they can help with the genetics just to select part of the population of the people that these clinical trials must be directly, you know, applied. That is, uh, I think, uh, our point working with uh, all this new genomic technology. Well, this is a, a summary of, uh, of, the previous. Of, the, of the previous comments. So, so the only thing I want to, you know, uh, remark is the genomic medicine or this precision medicine or personalized medicines may be involved in all of the stage of our lives. That's uh, my idea. So uh, precision medicine is one, one side is the diagnosis, the precise definition of, of uh, at the genomic level what is happening in a, or even at the phenomic level what is happening. In an, in an individual. The other thing is the approaches that are being developed to, to address these disorders. So different options are there, right? So there mm -hmm. is uh, directly repairing a protein or, right. or the DNA CRISPR. You have uh, complementation introducing gene therapy uh, and, and a, a missing or a defective protein. Uh, you can specifically treat defects in, in, a, in a protein uh, for example, an, a protein that is overactive, you can try to inhibit it, or you can uh, try to find drugs that rebalance unbalanced situations. So, which of these approaches are really are already uh, available, and, and how fast do you think this will develop? What, what will come of age first uh, for, uh, for treatment of, of, of patients which are not genetically defined or clinically very nicely, molecularly well defined? So I, I find that, that probably we, we, we need to, to, uh, to address the field by different uh, approaches. So the, the one you mentioned is it defining, I mean, precision medicine, new generation uh, and, and genomics needs a new generation of phenotyping of the patient. So probably we need to, to be more precise in the phenome of the patients. That means the whole clinical picture. And at the same time, probably, uh, it has been mentioned also uh, today, we need to have a large number of, of studies for complex and common diseases, in, especially in uh, psychiatry and neurodevelopment disorders. So, so up to date, we have been using GWAS approaches for this and, and, and using RIs. And, but probably uh, we need to, to arrange big studies and larger number of patients doing whole genome sequencing in order not, not to be missing that, uh, you know, not detected uh, uh, um, uh, uh, irritability of, of, the, of the genome of the patients and also trying to, to um, give some light of what, what is the mechanism uh, out there from the uh, epigenomics and, and transcriptomics I guess, studies. So uh, by doing this, we will be finding new genes, new pathways for these genes, and probably we will be stratifying different patients and finding what is the, the, the treatment and the targeted uh, treatment that that precise patient needs. So. Okay. So... Um well, at Horizon we have been developing uh, Vafidamstat and our initial studies, they were actually based 
on, on phenotypical observations that we could modify uh, defects in, in cognition or uh, complement effects in this uh, cognition or, or behavior at alterations. Uh, we took this drug into the, the, the phase one studies and phase two uh, studies and Dr. Ramos, he was actually um, participating in, in uh, or leading one of these studies uh, called Reimagine and, and in which patients with uh, ADHD, ASD and borderline personality disorder were being uh, treated with uh, Vafidemstad. Could you comment a little bit on, on this trial, Dr. Ramos? Sure, Tamara. Uh, well, um, uh, I, I remember uh, quite well the, the first moment that I had the opportunity to, to, to see the, the, the data about the, the efficacy of uh, Vafidemstad in rats in, in, in animal models, uh, improving cognition. But uh, on the other hand, one of the, 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 the surprising aspects was to see that these rats had a clear reduction of the uh, uh, aggression over the time. And that was the, the, the first point that uh, to, to, to start working with Bafinistat as a possible drug to reduce the aggression in, in patients with high levels of aggressivity. That is the case of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or borderline personality disorder, or autism spectrum disorder. And for the first time, uh, we developed a, a, a basket trial for these neurodevelopment disorders using this, uh, this drug. We, uh, the, the methodology of these clinical trials was a eight-week uh, treatment, uh, phase two open label, and we treat uh, 30, 30 patients, uh, uh, 11 ADHD, 12 for borderline personality disorder, and seven autism spectrum disorder. And here, you can see uh, the, clear, the significant reduction of the several scales that we use it to, to, to test, to assess this aggressivity. And that was nice because it was absolutely uh, transversal over the, these three disorders. And with these uh, uh, positive findings, now we are moving to, uh, to have a large clinical trial that uh, uh, there are two clinical trials. One is evolution for schizophrenia patients with only with also aggressivity, but also very cognitive damage. And uh, the other is portico study with borderline personality disorder. We include a sample of more than 200 patients for the the to have more data about these these positive findings. Also, it's it's important to to, to remember that. One of the issues managing aggressivity with this kind of patients is that we are now using antipsychotics with a profile of uh, adverse event not well tolerated in this kind of disorders. And in the case with Vafidenstad, we had no dropouts during this uh, period of time for adverse events, and the most common was a headache and was a dry month that was uh, transited and mild in terms of severity. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for ex explaining this. Um, the, these are still trials that are trying to treat the, the, the symptoms of the, of the patients. And to what extent do you think that, uh, I mean, how was aggression in patients mostly treated now? And, and uh, do you think that uh, Vafidemstad uh, uh, could add there? I mean, one of the things that we saw preclinically is that we had no sedation, but we were having a clear reduction of aggression. Is this kind of drug or, uh, needed also in the clinic? Is this an important issue for patients? Uh, that is the key, one of the key points, uh, as all of the aspects of innovation, the beginnings is a need that we not, don't have uh, or we, we don't, don't, we don't uh, uh, doesn't resolve. And that is a key point because a, a lot of drugs that we are using for managing the aggressivity has an increase uh, of, of, uh, of weight and the other uh, high levels of sedation with patients. And in this case, uh, with the the, the, uh, the clinical picture that we, we saw 
was a patient that reduced aggressivity but without this uh, without these side effects of sedation. Also, I think it's a very quality uh, quality data, but a lot of these patients ask us for the continuity of treatment of this uh, of, of with this drug, but unfortunately, it was not feasible because it was a phase two clinical trial. Yes. So, um, but I'll previously mentioned also accurate diagnosis and characterization of patients and treatment outcomes are key to evaluate whether a drug is helping a patient. And in that context, and then more moving toward precision medicine, uh, Horizon is collaborating with uh, Columbia University to characterize families in the Amish population that have uh, a mutation in SETD1A, which is one of these methyl, uh, histone methyl transferases that is uh, having an opposite activity to, to LSD1. And likewise, here in Spain, Horizon is collaborating with, with INGEM um, to, to characterize pa patients in an other population with defined genetic alterations candidate for treatment with uh, LSD1 inhibitors. Dr. Nevada, could you comment on this? Which kind of population is that and, and why is this needed before doing a trial? Okay, yes, because our goal is to uh, identify your or to determine uh, mostly appropriate uh, psychometric measures for a future clinical trial in the patient. We choose one of these uh, rare syndromes that I, I told before. Uh, it's a filum dermis syndrome because uh, it's a neurodevelopment disorder that is, becomes with uh, hypotonia, uh, sp a speech delay, neuro uh, de developmental delay, etc., and behavior anomalies. Behavior in the in the sense of uh, aggressivity, and more of this uh, part of the autistic uh, uh, spectrum disorders. But uh, aggressivity is one of them. So, and this uh, far, uh, drugs is uh, mainly before previously tested in in other patient on other patho mental uh, diseases where it is Alzheimer, um, and uh, we try to figure that out basis on this uh, great heterogeneity of, uh, of the uh, Philam McDermott patients. We have already characterized in Spain on, on, almost 200 patients. It's a rare disease, so there's many, many patients that are very, very good, good characterized clinical and genetically by our institution and other co uh, colleagues in and around uh, the Spain. So we're starting to try to select which part of, of, of this uh, subpopulation inside of this uh, Philam Madermic syndrome patients are the best to start with, you know, uh, trying to uh, valorate a possible or future clinical trial with uh, this drug if we mentioned it previously. Thank you. So um, another uh, population of interest, well, actually, Dr. Harris, uh, you are working a lot in the field of epigenetics, and epigenetics is a, combines the impact of, of, of environment, including nutrition and genetics on the, let's say, the balance of an organism. And the impact of diet can also be spectacular. An example that comes in mind is, is, uh, is queen bees. Queen bees receive a different diet when, uh, than uh, the worker bees, and this completely changes their, their aspect. So, um, uh, how important is epigenetics in, in CNS and neurodevelopmental disorders? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, we know that the role of epigenetics in uh, central nervous development and function is crucial. Uh, we know that because um, these disorders of epigenetics uh, they, um, there are many of them. There are more being discovered pretty much every day now. Now there are more than 90. And uh, the things that are consistent between them is that almost all of them, greater than 95% of them, have intellectual disability or significant cognitive dysfunction as part of the disorder, in addition to often a number of other wide-ranging neurologic effects but definitely cognitive function, it appears that the role of epigenetics is crucial. 
And even though there are different epigenetic disruptions in these different disorders, you universally see cognitive dysfunction. And so that tells us that the role of these epigenetic modifiers and epigenetics in general is really important for the proper development of the central nervous system. And um, although these disorders are individually rare, together they make up actually a sizable percentage of syndromic intellectual disability. So figuring out a way to treat or correct some of the issues in these epigenetic disorders could potentially lead to a sizable change in a large number of patients who have intellectual disability as a result of a genetic syndrome. The other thing is that most of these disorders are inherited in uh, a haploinsufficient form, meaning that you only need one copy of the two copies of the gene or protein to be disrupted in order to have the disorder, which also tells us that uh, these epigenetic modifiers and epigenetics in general is not only crucial to central nervous system development, but that it needs to be in an exact right balance in order for the brain to function appropriately. So could you tell a little bit more about Kabuki uh, syndrome? What is the Kabuki syndrome? Absolutely. Uh, so Kabuki syndrome is one of these, what we've termed Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery. So what we mean by that is a disorder that's inherited in a Mendelian fashion um, that uh, then affects the, uh, some component of the epigenetic machinery. In Kabuki syndrome, it affects um, uh, histone proteins. So uh, proteins that make marks on histones that then can open and close to allow the DNA to be available for transcription. And um, Kabuki syndrome is caused by defects in two different genes. The most common type of Kabuki syndrome known as Kabuki syndrome type one is caused by loss of function in KMT2D, which is uh, what we call a writer or a protein that makes a methyl mark on histones. And this tells the histones to open or allow the DNA to be available for transcription. Um, the other cause of Kabuki syndrome, less common, known as Kabuki syndrome type 2, is caused by a loss of function in KDM6A. KDM6A is actually a demethylase, or it removes a mark, so known as an eraser. But that mark that it removes is um, a closed chromatin mark. So at the end of the day, the effect of both types of Kabuki syndrome is to cause the histones to be too closed and the DNA to be too unavailable for transcription, thus causing a wide range of phenotypic factors. And Kabuki syndrome is characterized by a number of features, uh, intellectual disability being one of the most prominent, um, hypotonia or low muscle tone, skeletal abnormalities, growth deficiency, um, and um, some uh, dermatoglyphic abnormalities as well, it, but they can have a number of other organ system effects. So uh, cardiac, uh, renal, and many other organ systems involved. So Vafidemstat is an, an LSD1 inhibitor. Uh, it, has an, uh, inhib it is inhibiting the opposite uh, function. Which type of, could it be useful and which type of, of Kabuki, which of the two types or both could uh, benefit from treatment with an LSD1 inhibitor? So potentially both um, could benefit because again, the idea of, the, uh, of an epigenetic therapy like Vafidemstat would be to counteract, it does not fix the broken protein, so to speak, but it counteracts the imbalance that is created or the too much closed chromatin. So it is possible that Vafidemstat could treat both types of Kabuki syndrome. Um, the most immediately obvious target would be Kabuki syndrome type one or the more common type of Kabuki syndrome because again, that is a defect in a writer or a protein that places a methyl mark. And so you, Vafidemstat would be most directly counteracting the kind of reverse protein or the eraser 
that most directly affects that. And so that's the uh, most promising initial target. However, it is very possible and even likely that vafodemstat could be useful or other epigenetic therapies like vafodemstat could be useful in either type of Kabuki syndrome. Okay, so that is basically this this uh, background is is the reason why Orisin also recently announced that uh, we have received a one million dollar grant from the Kabuki syndrome philanthropists to support uh, development of a precision medicine trial, phase one two trial with Fafi Demstad in in uh, in in Kabuki, and we are working together with the Kennedy Krieger Institute to to make that real this trial uh, will be called hope <laughs> and this is also the, one of the reasons for the title of this of this um, uh, session uh, i don't know how much time we have left i think maybe we can go on and if there is time left we can uh, have questions from the public to our panelists now I am sorry, but I was informed that it's not possible to have questions from the people that are following this, this panel discussion online. So if there are any questions. No, then, then I would like to thank our panelists for thank participating, the, both uh, who have uh, joined us here and the people that have joined us uh, from remote and for uh, getting up so early, Dr. Harris. In, <laughs> in Washington. So thank you and uh, 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 let's uh, close this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all for showing us uh, the progress that precision medicine has to bring to modern psychiatry. And now, let uh, us uh, move on from that particular subject to turn to cancer, a disease that has hit society hard in recent uh, decades. But that will be in the next session, in the next uh, panel, that will, that will take part at uh, a quarter past one. So, see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.